This is this is this is. Hey, hey, folks, how are you guys doing? Um, I'm doing pretty good. Less than two weeks away till our shows. We're coming up to April 1st and 2nd. MXPX is gonna be playing live. First time in two years. It's gonna be amazing. I'm, I'm very excited. But we'll be there in less than two weeks. Um, don't wait if you still wanna get tickets. It's getting tight. Uh, we'll be in Anaheim at the House of Blues April 1st, okay? And then we'll be at the Marquee Theater in Phoenix, Arizona the very next night. So Friday night, Anaheim, Saturday night, Phoenix, Arizona. Both nights, MXPX, Zebrahead, Bad Cop, Bad Cop, and Mercy Music. Come on out, it's been too long. We can't wait to see you guys. We, uh, we're excited, we're looking forward to seeing your beautiful faces. We're looking forward to hearing your beautiful voices. So MXPX.com for tickets. Um, speaking of MXPX.com, let's just get right into this, uh, this podcast, really. It's just me today. Me and your voicemails, by the way, so thank you uh, for calling in. If you want to call in on a future episode, please do. The number is 1-360-830-6660. So that's a U.S. number. It's 1-360-830-6660. Call me. Tell me what's up. Maybe you want, want me to talk about a certain topic, a certain thing, a certain thing that I might know about, maybe bass playing, whatever. You know what's up. So anyway, do that. Appreciate you. But let's get back into this mxpeaks.com thing because we just dropped the vinyl for Southbound to San Antonio and it is the coolest vinyl that I think I've ever really seen seen on a record. Like the cover, you have to see this if you're, if maybe you already know, but I should have planned for this, but I didn't. Hold on, let me go find this cover. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, hope you guys were talking amongst yourselves. We'll just edit that out. All right, so here's the cover, and this baby is, like I said, the coolest thing we've ever done. It's a holographic image of the Poconecha Punk crowd surfing in San Antonio. You see that? How amazing is that? Now this, this record came out just beautifully, and thank you for anybody that's already ordered it. We've received a ton of orders, and uh, we're still shipping, so uh, it will be shipping all week. Um, it's only a couple people, including myself, uh, working on the shipping, so uh, it, takes, it takes quite a while. And my dad, shout out to my dad, my mom and my dad, of course, but my dad has been just a, a hero. He's been taking a lot of the order packages, like once we package everything up, put them in these boxes, and he's taking those to the post office and dropping them off. So uh, it's kind of an annoying part of the job that no one really likes to do, and so we're like making him do it. <laughs> Asking him to do it, and he's, he's graciously um, willing to continue to do it, so. Check it out. There's, um, there's just. Let me take take out these these records. Um, for those that aren't watching on YouTube, my YouTube is Mike Herrera Video, uh, but you can find me on YouTube, um, and you can see me kind of just undoing the whole cover. But this is the cover. It's a double gatefold, 12 inch, of course, um, and. It's just, it, it just is fun. It pops. It's all the photos from San Antonio, from the show, and uh, it just really, really captures how fun of a night it was. It was so much fun. So, the coolest cover we've ever done, and um, the vinyl. Here's red, and here is blue. Now they're all a little different, so just depending on what, you know, what you get, but. So there's that. Thank you so much uh, for all your orders, anybody that's ordered that. There's still some available, and the one I didn't show is probably, I probably like even better because it's, it's just so, it, it, it's so, I don't know, subtle yet, you, you move it and then in the light, the gold, splatter just comes alive. And I'm talking about the gold splatter version. Um, the other variation is is just gold splatter on both records. And 
It's beautiful. I love it. It's kind of a, it's on black. So gold splatter on black. So it kind of has a traditional look while having an also just a really beautiful look to it. Anyway, that, uh, that's what I've been doing for the last couple days, just helping out uh, the crew at Merch Arsenal and uh, shout out to Trey and Mary for helping out with, uh, with orders. And um, you know, we're gonna continue that as uh, we're not done yet. We're still sending out orders and orders are still coming in. So if you want to, uh, you want to get in on the vinyl train, go check out mxpx.com right now and uh, you probably will be able to get one. So uh, it, it's not sold out yet. So uh, keep checking back. We have uh, not only vinyl, if you're not a vinyl person, we got a bunch of other things and we'll get to it. So um, let's get to my first voicemail. Hey Mike, it's Derek in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a band merch freak. You know, my <laughs> okay. drawers are overflowing with uh, band shirts, my closet's full of these. And uh, of course, you know, lots of MXPX merch. So, uh, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, as a musician myself in a band who, you know, I, I pay attention, I design a lot of the merch for our band. Um, well, all of it, yeah. But uh, no, really, like I'd love to hear the evolution of MXPX merch. Like, what are some of your favorite things you guys have done? What would you love to do again that you haven't done in a while, or you know, like what have you learned along the way? Um, I'm sure that's that's plenty plenty of question for you there. So uh, plenty of ground ground to cover. Thanks a lot, Derek. How perfect is this question? How perfect? I was just talking about merch, and and merch really is sort of our day to day. You know, when when it comes to what we do with the band. Um, we're not making an album every day. We're not doing a show every day. But every day we are usually in there sending out orders, packaging orders, trying to figure out new items to put in there. So let's talk about the evolution and, and what I've learned. Um, you know, we started out early, early in our years, DIY completely. And at some point we got too big for that and we moved into you know, employing bigger companies and, you know, it's always about trying to streamline some of the work when it comes to, you know, when it gets too big for bands, they, they, they want to give up that work, you know, we give up that work. We also give up a lot of profits and sometimes it's worth it, completely worth it. And you don't always have time as a musician to do all the things that need doing. You need a team, you need need to build out that network of people helping you. Um, and, and so I think the main thing I've learned is, is um, if you're going to do it DIY, you have to really pay attention. And, and, and a lot of times it's, it's like not ordering too much. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, the, what comes to mind, something funny that comes to mind is the MXPX flip flops. We ordered those, 10 years ago or something like that. We ordered a bulk of these flip-flops. Not really, back then we didn't really think about, okay, how many do we sell normally, blah, blah, blah. We just thought about, oh, it's a really, really good deal to buy in bulk the, this item. And we got them for, you know, so, such a good price. We just ordered a ton. So we had, we had these flip-flops for years and, and a lot of you listening are probably gonna guess, I have some, I have those flip-flops. And, and they're great flip-flops, Let's don't get me wrong. They're they turned out awesome. They're MXPX, the poking at your punk head on them, the whole deal. And they're just your basic flip flop. But that's something that um, became kind of a joke, you know, because we still had a bunch of these flip flops. So years later, you know, if you want flip flops, you can always get them. Um, and so I think, I think another thing we, you know, one thing we learned through that was, okay, scarcity is better for us. If we don't make as many people, we'll either buy it or they won't buy it and then we can move on but having things uh i don't know just sitting in your warehouse warehouse i use that term very lightly um storage shed <laughs> having just a bunch of things in your storage shed for years and years it, it just it's not i don't know it's not conducive you don't have this we don't we don't personally have the space for it so there's just a lot of things like that. So there's one thing. So um, don't order too much if you can't, you don't know where to put it. 
Also, you know, there's, there's, don't order too little, you know, it's going to make people mad if you don't have enough. So there's some items like with vinyl, a lot of times we order just about as much as we possibly can, or we think we can sell in a reasonable amount of time. So it's like, it goes back and forth depending on what it is we're trying to do. But when it comes down to it, we're just trying to make people happy. We're trying to come out with merch items that, that are fun. Um, obviously classic t-shirts, you know, you see, you go to, um, you go to like any sort of like established act that's been around for a long time, like say like a no effects or a bad religion or a descendants. I think MXPX is part of that category. And so when we're doing shows, we want to have our logo there, you know, like MXPX logo, boom, poking at your punk head, boom, all this stuff. So, uh, you know, to me, it's, it's, um, you know, it's about giving people what they want in some ways, but it's also about just staying true to what your band is, is going for, what aesthetic your band is trying to do. And, and of course, we've had different aesthetics over the years. We've gone into, you know, the Broken Bones style, poking at your punk with a skull, you know, and bones and things. We've done all that, like the darker look. We've done bright, you know, our first t-shirt ever was, um, was it said magnified plaid and it was in in green ink instead of black ink and uh the back was like all these colors like a plaid you know a plaid shirt but on a white t-shirt and one of our first tour shirts in 1995 when we started touring was a tour shirt that said said magnified plaid and then it, it was a crayola crayon box so it was like an actual crayon box that, it, but it said, you know, it said magnified plaid, then it said MXPX. Um, so yeah, you know, the the evolution has changed so much over the years, you know, because we've had other people design design logos for us. We've designed them ourselves. Obviously, we've taken them off of the album artwork. So like somebody like John Nissen, who designed the Poganetcha Punk, and and the first couple, uh, our first couple album covers and our our latest self-titled he did those and so you know we try to we try to just think about where we are as far as where we are meaning what are the logo logos that we've been using lately and we we kind of use a lot of the same logos over and over and over and then we just branch out the images and we we add different images we add different colors and so I think you're going to see in the future another shift in in some of the designs. I mean, there's there's artists that come and go, and you know I've I've actually been tasked many different times over the years, um, some far in the past, some very recent, where I'm actually contacting artists to do designs, and um, sometimes it's just cold emails, sometimes it's DMing people's Instagrams, um, and then sometimes it's people you know. So you know it just depends, but um, it's the there's never like a one one way we do things there's never like a streamlined way to do what we do because it's always changing and so like in the same way I write songs um, we do everything else like I, I don't have a formula for writing songs although some would say oh well that's all you don't have a formula you could have fooled me it sounds the same every song you write you know but that's somebody that okay well I, I get that sure but uh, no, I don't have a formula. I write a new song every time in a new way. And sure, uh, in the way I write songs, sometimes I, I, I pick up a guitar and I, and I start singing. And sure, that's done the same way. But I guess what I mean is there's no like, all right, if I do this, then it comes out like this, and then it comes out like this. Like, I just don't know. Like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make up words along a story path, a theme. But it might change, you know, I might come up with something that changes the theme of it. And, and that happens with merch all the time, is, is you're trying to go for some certain kind of look or a, a certain type of item, and they send you the wrong thing, and you're like, okay, well, I like, I like this too, or this wasn't what I wanted, but this could work for this. So, you know, in the world we live in nowadays, it's, uh, <laughs> it, you can't plan so far ahead when it comes to that kind of stuff. It's really hard. Although, you know, you have to plan a little bit ahead or else you're not going to be getting anything in time. So it's a very thin line. Merch. I mean, 
thank you everybody that that supports the merch store because that really is is the main like like I said earlier the day to day way that we spend time and we spend um, a lot of our you know just a lot of our energy into making sure that people get what they need and 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 believe me I know that things aren't perfect the website will be overhauled and the store will be you know everything will get upgraded as years go on so that's a never-ending process we just upgraded our website about two years ago so maybe now it's less it's actually not less more more like um, I want to say it was like right around self-titled <laughs> so uh, but it was after that as well when we did between this world and the next so I guess it was about two years ago we started doing those live streams uh, but it, the point is it's just a never-ending process all right. Thanks for your call, Derek. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, let's get to the next the next call. Hey, Big Mike. How you doing? Big fan. I got two questions. One, what were your main vocal influences when you first started and throughout your career? Number two. Okay, let me let me answer that, and then we'll get to number two. I don't know what that is, but. Main vocal influences um, throughout my career. Okay, okay, let's go back. Let's go far back. Back all the way. My first couple influences vocally, and I would say number one would be Huey Lewis. Huey Lewis in the news. Huey, so Kiwi. Um, just hearing him sing, and the record I had was, well, I had all the, I had all the records. Um, my mother had had a couple cassette tapes that she would she would play or she would let me play and I would take those into my room and and jam. So <clears throat> you know it started out with with four, the album four, which has like stuck with me. It has um I don't know what else it has, but it has a bunch of great songs. Um and then and then I got into Picture This, Picture This, which that record blew me away. That's that's. I think that record itself is why I have the heart I have to write a lot of the songs I write, because it's just I would sing like I was walking down a one-way street, just a looking for someone. I mean, you know what I mean? Like I would just like play that in my room and sing to it, and and I feel like that gave me like a lot of my vocal influence. Great question about that. Um, from there, it went to the Beatles. I mean, always. I don't know if the Beatles were a vocal influence, but more of a song influenced influence in general. But um, vocally, let's see who else. You know, definitely as far as punk bands go, Milo from The Descendants, Milo Ackerman. Um, he's been on the podcast, and I tell him that. And, and so, like ba bands like that, Descendants. Um, who else in the punk? The Clash. I mean, but I don't sing anything like it. I guess you don't have to sing exactly like somebody to be an influenced by them. Okay, my final one. Elvis Costello was was a huge influence, and that was after we were established as a punk band. But I was discovering more about songs, more about songwriting, more about music in general. And Steve Kravak turned me on to Elvis Costello, got me his box set, which had all of the, it was a CD box set, actually. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't vinyl. But that's what we were on in those days. It was CDs. So I got the CD box set of Elvis Costello. Um, and, and the rest was history. I mean, just his, his catalog is just absolutely mind-blowing because... Not only does he have like Welcome to the Working Week and things like that uh, from his early stuff, he's got um, songs like Indoor Fireworks, songs like um, Just Like Candy. Um, that was co-written with uh, Paul McCartney, I believe. But um, it, it sounds just like he's another Beatle and he's just writing his songs and he just happened to not have, you know, the other f three guys, you know, that the Beatles guys had. So, I mean, it, it, to me, he is uh, a huge, huge part of, of my vocal influence, but also songwriting. Cool. Let's get on with your part two question. Number two, 
Do you have any interesting stories about your uh, drum machine Joy cover or Ronnie Martin or Joy Electric in general? Uh, and that's about it. The music you guys have done over the years means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. All the best to all you and your families. Peace. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, drum, drum Machine Joy. So for those that maybe don't remember, we've covered a song called Drum Machine Joy. And uh, yeah, I mean, Ronnie Martin, you know, he, he, uh, so he was a guy that was on Tooth and Nail Records. So Joy Electric was the name of his, like, I guess it was like um, his, the equivalent of being a DJ nowadays, but you like write songs and you like, program them and it's it's like um if if somebody made nintendo music but then sang songs to it <laughs> that, that was that was my first impression of joy electric but it was it's also my my impression now <laughs> and i like it i mean i liked some of it some of it wasn't my cup of tea but i never didn't like it i, I was just always like wow this is this is out there but but then again it was like you know, a lot of the music that I hear other musicians are into, I am not into. And, and so this would be sort of one of those things. I wonder what influences Ronnie has to make the kind of music that he makes. This like super, super electronic beep, beep, pop, beep, beep with like vocals that sound like this. So you can imagine MXPX covering one of those songs, it was super weird for people to like go, what, what, what? How did this happen? But uh, we really liked the song, Drum Machine Joy. It seemed like out of all his songs, and I'm sure we could have probably come up with other ones that worked, but it was the song we could figure out how to translate into a punk song. And, you know, this was our first time doing that. This was our very first cover album, cover EP, in fact and we just weren't really, we weren't very well versed in playing songs at all, like not even just our own songs. So you can imagine it was a little weird, but uh, you know, Ronnie was a cool dude, man. He was always way cooler than us. Anytime we'd see him out at a show, um, him and his, his brother, Jason Martin, Jason and Ronnie Martin were the two coolest guys signed to Tooth & Nail Records back in the day. And um, they made they made music that was that was like kind of it was very hip. It was very much like not in the mainstream, but it, it was really good for what it was. It was just like something that people didn't quite understand. I, I guess that's the way I should describe it. I mean, people didn't understand. I didn't understand it. I, it was it was beyond my I don't know my my repertoire you know, of, of music. Nowadays, of course, it makes total sense because it's like, okay, yeah, I get it. But, but bef back then, electronic music was not something that people knew about, you know. EDM didn't exist. Maybe it existed and it was called house music or it was called something else, but it definitely wasn't called EDM at the time. So MXPX covering an EDM type pop song was, uh, that was pretty punk, I think. Anyway, thanks for the call. Let's get to the next one. Hi, Mike. This is Josh Henderson. I'm from Nebraska. I was wondering if you would like to expound, is that a word? <laughs> Go further into detail on some of the songs you've written throughout the year. Maybe like Andrea or What's Mine Is Yours or Rainy Day. You know, I know some artists don't want to, you know, put dirty laundry out to dry in public, so <laughs> I know you might not go into too many details on some of those songs, but just any song maybe that you would like to go into more detail on, I would love that. I've always been listening to the songs, and you do a good job of getting the story told, but I've always wondered more about what what else is going on, what else happened to inspire this song, so... I was hoping maybe you do that for one or two songs, maybe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, Josh. Um, yeah, I mean, I got a lot of songs, so we could go anywhere. But you, you, you kind of started it off, Andrea, 
from Life in General. That was a song I wrote for an ex-girlfriend, and at the time, she was my girlfriend, so it kind of made sense. Um, it's a funny thing, because I wrote that about the first day we met, the first day we hung out, and so really that's a, di di a distillation, sorry, a distillation of, of that day, and my, in my mind, what stuck out that day. And, and I think of other things that day that I did, that we did, that, that happened, and it didn't make it into the song, you know? But, uh, you know, mostly I kind of just, I have a, a memory of like walking outside one building to another building. Like that was like one of the first memories I have of that festival. It was a festival in, I think in Indiana, in fact, and um, something like that. Kentucky, no, duh, what am I thinking, duh. It's, <laughs> smallest, it was in the smallest town in Kentucky. That's where, that's where the festival was, called Ichthus. But um, we only played it one time, and, and that was my experience, and, and uh, had a, a long-distance relationship with Andrea for a long time, and then she eventually moved out to Washington for a while. But we eventually broke up. I mean, it was hard being on the road and, and all that, as you know. But uh, we were young, and so young meaning early 20s, early to mid 20s. Um, yeah, I think so. Anyway, uh, <laughs> like, it's funny, you know, thinking about, you know, like old relationships and things like that. It's like what I thought was like many, many years probably was only just like a couple of years. It was a couple of years of of this, a couple years of that, because things happened in a really compressed amount of time back then. Nowadays it feels like things are, are stretched out and things take a lot more time to develop. And, and, and it sounds counterintuitive because technology is moving so quickly and our news moves so quickly, but really I think, you know, just the things that we, that we actually do that matter are, are, are happening at a slower pace these days. And, and I think back when I was growing up, when MX Peaks was starting out, things seemed to happen all together. But maybe that's an age thing as well. That could be an age thing. Uh, <laughs> um, What's Mine Is Yours, that's a, a song that uh, a lot of people probably have no idea what it's about. And for those that don't know, it's about it's about being mad, you know, it's about being mad at somebody for for not being open, not being truthful. And you know, specifically it's about our old record label to the Nell Records. And we when we had our falling out with them, we we wrote well, I wrote a, a couple songs about it and that was that's sort of the main one that, that made it to the record and and things like that. There was a few comments in other songs, but but this song in particular was just it was just being mad, you know, and and something about Buffalo and even Life in General and, and the earlier records, so some of the songs, not all of them, some of them I, I see the lyrics and I see that I see me as a kid. I see, oh, that's me being a kid. That's that's I can see how people can relate to these lyrics so much because I was so raw, so raw. And I still am raw in a lot of ways, but I was so unpolished and so just almost embarrassingly putting my heart on my chest, you know, outside my chest, on my sleeve, uh, and showing everybody and going, this isn't a simple, sorry, this is a very simple case of being being, you know, having my feelings hurt for this or that or, or whatever, but like, <laughs> I would just say that, you know, I would just honestly say whatever it was that was bothering me. Um, maybe I, maybe I did veil it in some lyrical, lyrical um, shadows, lyrical uh, drapery, if you will, but um but back then, I, I, I mean, it's not like my lyrics have changed a ton or anything. I have a similar style as I've always had, but I definitely feel like I've gotten better over the years at telling a story, at making things make sense. And, and a lot of times things make sense to me and they don't make sense to other people. And I, and I write almost something that tickles me in my brain and I'll write it out. And it, and it sounds cool to me, but to somebody else, they'll read it, and hopefully it sounds cool to them, and it's got a, a, 
a lot of a lot of the way you you can sing something will make it catchy so the way you uh, dictate it um, but plenty of times I'm sure somebody looks at a lyric and they're like I did not get I'm not in on the inside joke or the inside meaning of this and that's okay too because I don't necessarily always I'm not necessarily always writing to convey exactly what I mean um, sometimes I want to write what I mean but I want it to be veiled I want it to have that that drapery on there that, that conceals the real meaning of it but um, I think art's always been like that hopefully uh, hopefully you guys got something out of that I could keep going on on more songs but maybe we'll just you know if you want more song stuff call in again with more sp other songs and, and I'll talk about them uh, couple more couple more and then we'll wrap this puppy up thank you guys appreciate it hi Mike okay this is Jen from Southern California and I thought I would just call and represent um, I don't know kind of represent the ladies because I feel like you have a lot of dudes that call your podcast and um, I always think what a huge fan I've been I mean since 94 and um, I just wanted to call and let you know that I've grown up with you guys and to this day I'm still at shows I mean for my 40th I was out there in Texas I flew to Texas to see you guys play and um I just think it's so rad to have grown up with you guys and um shout out to Holly shout out to you as a family man being so relatable to me and to see your family and to um Oh no. I think she lost signal. Maybe she was in the car. Jen, thank you so much for repping the ladies. And maybe you had a question in there and you can always maybe call back another time and, and leave it. But um, thanks for calling. Yeah, you know, not enough ladies have been calling in on this podcast. So if you've been thinking about it, you've been listening to this for a while, maybe you have something you want to mention. Maybe you have something you want me to just go on about, jaw on about, jaw on about, just to make sure you understood what I was trying to say. Um, please call in. Yeah, we need more more ladies repping. So thank you, Jen. Thanks for coming out to Texas. Uh, our last show in, you know, back in 2020. Hopefully we'll see you uh, in April at, in Anaheim. If you can't make it, hey, no sweat. Don't don't feel bad. But uh, thank you so much for repping the ladies. And like I said, if, if you are another lady out there, please call in. We need we need more rep from y'all ladies. Okay, last one. Here we go. Hey, Mike. Drew Hall here. My question is, what has been the best decision the band ever made? And also, are there any not-so-great decisions that you guys have learned from? Thanks, man. Looking forward to the new album and hope you guys come back to Florida soon. Peace out. Drew, I love how short and sweet that is. Um, best and worst decisions. Wow, this is a tough, tough question. Best decision. Now, I'm probably going to think of something later on after I'm done with this that's way better. But one of the best decisions we ever made was... Obviously signing the Tooth and Nail Records, but... <laughs> it's also one of the worst decisions we've ever made. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm not going to lie. Um, but let, let me be serious. I guess, you know, we can talk about alternate realities and, and you know, the way life could have been and would have been or should have been and this and that. But we only have one life that we know about. So um, I think the best decision we ever made was was going back to our DIY roots, was getting off of first major label, then we were on a series of, of indies, um, and we we decided just to go DIY and release music by ourselves on our own, to just try it out. And it's not easy, but it's honestly the same amount of work that we would do anyway if we were doing it with a record label. It's just we now don't have to split the profits. Um, and as you know, the profits aren't insane. You have to do, you know, a lot of people have asked, how do you make money in a, you know, playing music in a band? How does MXPX do it? And it's, and it's never an easy answer. And it's always something like, you know, we, we take 
different things and put it into the pot and that makes up a bigger amount of, of ways to support ourselves. So, you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, mer the merch store online, releasing music, um, going and doing shows, obviously licensing, and, and, and I'm sure there's more stuff I'm not thinking of, but that's the thing is like all these things combined help us stay afloat, but one thing by itself would not be enough. So one of the best things, going back to the best and worst, is was taking some of our power back. And and I'm not gonna say, oh, we were oppressed and this and that, people that know the, the story behind Tooth and Nail and we were ripped off, well, you know, it also got us here, you know? So like, it's funny how the idea of being oppressed and being ripped off and, and being lied to and, and da, da 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 it kind of, it kind of made us who we are in some ways and it, and it got us where we are in a lot of ways. And so I can't really knock it. I gotta just say like, okay, that was just part of our journey and part of our story. I'm not so mad about it anymore. Now, do I want to? Do I want people to take advantage of me now to, I don't know, guarantee some sort of uh, positive outcome later on in life again? I don't know if that's the way it works, honestly. I, I don't think that's the way it works. I think, you know, it was a huge life lesson to learn what we learned over the years in the music business and you know it's continuing to to blow our minds when we we learn more and more about how business works about how life works about how things in the bureaucracy of 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 life work you know all the paperwork that it takes to be in business you know and depending on, and, and it changes depending on where you're doing things at so i mean um back down to the the core question best and worst decision i think taking Taking our power back, honestly, how, how can you go wrong? Um, you know, we talked about merch at the beginning of the show, and we were talking about how at the beginning we we, we were DIY, DIY merch, and then we got it got too big, and we had to hire other companies where it was. They took the orders, they fulfilled the orders, they sent the orders out, and we would just get a little check at the end of the month for like whatever the profits were, and it was a split of that, you know, and it was like how are we not making any money? And it was like, okay, because there's like 50 or more artists on this one site. And if you go to that site and try to find MXPX, good luck. And then if you're specifically looking for MXPX, it's still just like such a smaller percentage of the profits. And, and so like, I think there's, like I said, when you have a lot of volume, huge, huge amounts of volume, those smaller percentages add up and then you're good. But, when you're in a punk band, we're not Adele, we're not U2, we're not, we're not a, you know, like like who would be now, like Drake, you know, or something like that. So, um, you know, we do great, we do amazing, but we gotta advocate for ourselves. And and so because when we figured that out, when we started advocating for ourselves and doing the work ourselves, things got better. And sure. That some things sometimes go wrong, but I feel like things go wrong even more when you're not handling it yourself. When it's it's uh, some company on the East Coast that's you know got your your T-shirt on their website and somebody orders it, they don't really have the same amount of urgency to get that order out. They're just gonna do it as they do it. And when somebody orders a T-shirt from MXPX.com, we have we have so much more of a of urgency and an agency, I guess. And our agency is to do this right. You know, it's this is us. This is not us working for somebody else. This is this is us. And so, man, that is a great feeling. Is a great feeling. And and I tr I truly take the positive as much as possible out of of one being busier. You know, yes, I am a little bit busier. Um, at home because we do these, you know, these, you know, like with Southbound of San Antonio and the box set. Um, the box set's probably one of the best merch items that I didn't mention that earlier. Definitely one of the best merch items we've ever done. And it's got all 10 of our records, at, at least up to date 10 of our records and uh, all on vinyl. And yeah, I just, man, just so happy, so grateful to be doing what I'm doing. It doesn't even seem real. Like sometimes I just wake up and I'm like, is this my, this is my life? Like I, I get to, 
I get to go and, you know, go load up a bunch of merch, you know, packages and send them out to people from Wyoming, from Atlanta, from Indiana, you know, you can just name anywhere, Arizona, they're going all over the place, California, Florida, all over the world, in fact, Poland the other day we sent out, I was like, wow, that's, that's close to the war zone. I mean, I hope, I hope it gets there. I hope, you know, you know, so like we've even sent stuff, not recently, but we've had orders go to Russia. Um, you know, so like we're a worldwide um, organization and in the future, I don't expect that to change at all. So um, much love to everyone that's been listening. I appreciate it. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this, this, uh, this episode. Yeah, this was all about some merch stuff, some songs, the way, the way I think about things a, a lot of times. And um, I'm just grateful to be here. And I guess I didn't get to the worst decision, did I? Maybe the worst decision was having Creighton Burke manage us. But, but again, like I say, um, <laughs> we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Creighton Burke either. You know, he's part of the story. And he was a manager we had back when we really started picking up steam. You know, he picked us up in Seattle and, uh, and we, we went, we went running pretty fast after that, but, but we were going to be doing that anyway. And I'm convinced of that. So I feel like that's, that could be a tie for, for one of the worst decisions we ever made as well. <laughs> but like I said, I've learned so much because of him, because of the bad things that he did, because of the things that we didn't pay attention to at the time, uh, the red flags, all, all of it, you know. So uh, like I said, I, e even when I screw up, I try to eventually find, um, find the positive, find the good, find my reason to smile. So I hope you can find your reason to smile today and, and the rest of the week and the rest of the year. So hope to see you guys in April if you can make it to the, the West Coast, April 1st in Anaheim, California, and then April 2nd in Phoenix, Arizona. MXPeaks.com for tickets, you guys. But thank you so much. Shout out to Bob McKnight uh, for uh, putting up with me. I'm getting this in pretty late, but uh, I just appreciate you guys for listening, all right? Till next week. Cheers.